Welcome back to Virtual School Assembly. Today, our guest is Jeff Platt. Jeff is an award-winning TV news reporter. He works in Bakersfield, California as an investigative journalist and as a mentor to young reporters. We're gonna talk a little bit more later on about what that means to be a mentor to young reporters. But first, uh, Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Tyler. This is great. Yeah, I, I'm excited because we've had a, a number of celebrities, obviously, and some professional athletes on the show. Um, but I've, I've started to reach out to news reporters because I thought with kids, a lot of them, they, they have stars in their eyes. They want to be celebrities. They want to be on TV. They want to do that. And there's such a middle area between, you know, a rock star or a celebrity and someone who does local news and, and local journalism. And so I'm excited to talk to you today a little bit about your journey as a journalist and as a reporter, um, but then to talk about kind of that whole world, because just like the pandemic has been crazy and things are changing, the, the news world has changed a lot in the last few years. So um, before we get into that, let's go back in time and just tell us a little bit about who you are, your, where you're from. Uh, give us kind of your origin story. Absolutely. So I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, small apartment, family of four, uh, not a lot of space to go around. Uh, but we made the most of it and every day was great. Uh, I was, you know, and getting into what inspired me to go into my field, growing up in Brooklyn, I was a kid in elementary school when the 9-11 attacks happened. And you want to talk about a day full of uncertainty, being a child in an elementary school auditorium, not being told anything of what's going on, not being able to reach anyone. This is, I know this is going to be tough for the kids who listen to this to understand. This was before children had cell phones. Uh, so we couldn't get a hold of anyone. We didn't know what was going on. And from that day forward, I never wanted to not know what was going on. And so I kind of tracked myself into journalism Eventually, once I graduated from high school, I went to the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University, left there. Uh, I took my first TV reporting job in Wyoming. I went from there to Idaho. Now I'm in California. And uh, every step along the way, I uh, just grew a little more, learned a little more of what it is to do this job in this technology age and how to be unique. And not, you know, we hear that term branding all the time, but not just creating a brand that you like, but creating a brand that other people see value in. And so that's, it's been a wild ride. Yeah, I, I bet. And so it's, it's fun. Um, I'm here in Utah. And so I know how glamorous it, it has been for you to go to Wyoming and then to Idaho, because that's not probably what you envisioned coming out of journalism school. Um, but what were those experiences like for you as far as stepping stones and helping you along your way? Um, you know, what were some of the, the benefits of, of going to some of those smaller markets first? Well, I'll tell you what, growing up in New York, if you said, Jeff, point at Wyoming on a map, uh, that would not have been doable as a kid, <laughs> uh, probably not even as a teenager. But I am so happy that I did it because I grew up in a city of 8 million people. And then my first job out of college was in a city of 55,000 people. And you get such a great appreciation for what smaller America is, why people love it there, why people see the value in there. But then you also realize that even though it's a small town, it's just like every other city in America. They've got their same problems, their same triumphs, their, their same uh, political issues that are happening at the same time. And it's so unique because it's so much more intimate that people are willing to speak their minds more just uh, ferociously because they know that their neighbor already knows what they think. So there's no, there's no shyness. There's no coyness about it. The wonderful thing about living in those smaller towns is that they live by this thing called the Code of the West, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And rule one of the Code of the West is talk less, say more. And that's how they live. And so everything is just so direct and in your face that you can't help but to have an appreciation for it. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of value in that, especially in a, a business like yours that's so busy that things are happening all the time. Now, I think a lot of kids, when, when we talk about news and reporting and journalism, that all clumps together for them. So let's talk for a minute about different aspects of your job, because you're both a journalist and a reporter, and those are different things. 
So can you talk about that for a second? You know, they absolutely are. And you're right. It's two hats that you have to wear constantly. And the way that I separate them is by also combining them. You have to do them at the same time. And what it really comes down to is a journalist is someone who goes out, gets those facts, asks the questions, does all the legwork, and then the reporter in you is the person who presents that information in a way that everyone else can not just understand and relate to, but they can actually care about. You know, uh, not everyone's going to pick up the Wall Street Journal and read it tomorrow because it's just not in a vernacular that people are accustomed to. So your job as a reporter is very similar to your job as a fifth grade teacher. It's to take algebra and make it understandable. You know, it's to take math with letters and make it something that makes sense. Right. And, and I think that's important. I, I like that you, you kind of separated these two different professions because I, I think sometimes we forget how important journalism is for reporters. And, and because you do both, you can certainly appreciate that. But there are other reporters that, that don't do a lot of the investigation, that don't do a lot of the research, and they're more of the on-air celebrities where they're there because they, they speak clearly, because they have a good persona. But for you personally, what has been the value of becoming a journalist and having that side? Does it make you a better reporter? I think it absolutely does. And I think the reason why it does is because it goes back to this old saying that a lot of people have probably repeated and butchered a thousand times, including myself. But there was a king that said, I don't care if people love me or hate me so long as they respect me. And that is the value of being a journalist before being a reporter is that whatever I put on the air, whatever I put on social media, whether or not people like it, whether or not, and when I say like it, I mean whether or not it conforms with their worldview. They have a respect for me because they know my track record of work. And so because of that, they're more upset with the facts than they are with the messenger. And that is so important because it's okay to be upset with the facts. It's okay to not like things and not agree with things. But what's wrong is shooting the messenger. And so, but when you have that track record of reliability and respectfulness and, and going deeper in and knowing what you're talking about and having that subject matter knowledge, that gives people that respect for you that, again, they'll be disappointed with the facts, but never with you. Right. I, I totally agree with that. And as a lifelong learner, I mean, part of being a school teacher is seeing the value in doing the research and in understanding yep. the facts. Um, but also that's just kind of the foundation for living a fulfilling life. If, if you become curious, if you're asking questions, that's going to lead to a better life. And, and, you know, we talked earlier about titling this episode, Investigate the World. I think one of the things that students need to be doing or at least thinking about right now is what kinds of questions are they asking? How are they going about the research process? Now, with your experience in, in journalism, what are some suggestions you could give to kids on, you know, how to be curious and how to investigate now so they don't have to like create new habits down the road? Well, and this goes into what I was telling you before we got started recording here, that when people think of industries that have been changed by the internet, the first thing they think of is retail, which is absolutely true. But the second thing that really should come to mind is journalism, because the thing that's changed for us the most is that people used to have this just insatiable thirst for knowledge that they had to come to us to quench. And then all of a sudden, oh, I have a question. I can't remember something. I don't know how something works. I want to know something about the government. I'll just Google it. And in 10 seconds, two seconds, one second, they have their answer. And so the reason why I wanted to title this Investigate the World is because when you think of investigating the world, it, it's such a broad thing that it opens you up to, there's no question that's not worth asking. There's no question that's a dumb question. There's no question that's not worth getting the answer to. And most importantly, if you could be the first person to understand that and say, this is a question that everyone else has passed up as meaningless, but I'm going to be the one to go get the answer. That's how you create that brand that gives value to people because 
if you Google something and no one's ever written anything about it on the internet before, Google's not going to help you much. But if you can be that first person to get that thing on the internet, Google's going to you every time. Yeah, that's certainly true. And in fact, I've, I've had some personal experience with that. Um, back in the good old days, let's say like 10 years ago, I started writing Wikipedia articles. And the reason I started doing that is I would Google something or I'd go onto Wikipedia to find out some details. And if there wasn't an entry there, I was like, well, I should write that entry. And so I started doing that. You know, and it's amazing because it opened doors for me. One is I wrote some articles that had got millions, some like in the tens of millions of views. Um, but then I also developed the skill of how to write a Wikipedia article, which ha has helped me. I actually, I've, I've connected with a lot of really influential people because I wrote an article about them, told them about it, and we had a conversation and they were all excited. So it's opened doors for me with working with celebrities and working with some professional athletes just because I asked the right questions, you know, so that certainly is true. Cool. And you just mentioned something that I just want to harp on, Tyler, mm -hmm. asking the right questions. I know I just said no question's a dumb question, but that doesn't mean that some questions can't be great questions. And the question I think everyone needs to start asking themselves isn't what, but so what? Right, Not right. what happened, but so what does this mean for me, for you, for my neighbor? And that's, and that's a key distinction that I think moving forward, a lot of children need to learn is that it's not just about critical thinking, it's about critical questioning. Yeah. And we really don't do a good enough job with that in schools um, because that should be the question in every subject that we teach is, is so what? So if, if we're learning history, so what? Well, how does that apply to our world today? And, and just in this interview, now our students are thinking, so what? Why does it benefit me to know about investigative journalism? Uh, what's the so what there? Well, we've already hit on it. Asking critical questions and, and thoughtful questions, it's going to lead to you being an influencer, to helping other people solve problems. And so that's part of the so what. But what are some other benefits? Like if, if we're saying so what to investigative journalism, what are some other things that kids can take away from this that asking good questions, how's that going to make their life better? It's going to make your life better in so many ways, starting with, you know, right now you're in fifth grade, you're 10 years old, your parents say, do this. And you say why, and you get the classic because I'm your father and I told you so. And dad, there's nothing wrong with saying that. But if you can start questioning, and it's not about questioning authority, it's about questioning processes, it's about questioning workflow, those are the questions outside of investigative journalism that have changed industries so far over. I mean, you look at all of the billionaires on this planet, and it's not because they invented anything incredible that didn't exist before. It's because they saw something that already existed, and they disrupted it by saying, why are we doing step one, two, and three when we can do steps A, B, and C? And no one had ever thought about that before because they didn't question it critically. And so that's why asking questions, especially critical questions, questions that get down to the core of not just why something exists, but why we do something a certain way and why we conform to certain bubbles and to certain pathways, it can disrupt everything in a great way. And that's how things change. And that's how you become a leader and eventually that's how you end up making a living for yourself is by being the person who's not going to sit around and say, this is how we always did it. But the person who really digs in and says, well, let's look at why we always did it this way. And let's see if we can do it better. Investigative journalism doesn't just exist in the field of news. It, it should exist in every single industry. And we know it does because the best people and the best leaders in every industry are by my definition, investigative journalists, people who think and question critically. Absolutely. And, and I think that's obvious. When you look at the leaders in the world today, the people who are leading industries, it's the people who are asking the right questions and then are taking action to answer those questions. Now, you said something that triggered a nerve in me. So I want to hop on a soapbox for just a second. I don't do this very often on the show, but I, I am a school teacher. So I'm going to get on a soapbox for a second. Um, you said something about you know, a kid asking a question and then the adult saying, because I said so. And I think 
this is a traditionally we saw that a lot in in older generations that parents would just push it to the side and say because i said so as a parent of four children that's one of the things that's really hard for me is to anytime they ask a question to answer the question and not just say you know you'll i'll t tell you when you're older or whatever but the cool thing here is and, and so i'm preaching to you kids out there when you're adults determined to not be one of those parents um, because when your kids ask why or how and you actually answer it then they understand and they can move forward they're not going to keep asking you that same question over and over so it actually will save you time and energy to answer the question but then you have kids who ask critical questions and, and what we're talking about now right now Jeff is kids who ask questions are the people who are going to change the world and I've certainly seen that with my kids they are doers. I mean, my 14-year-old son has saved thousands of dollars this summer because he's worked hard, he's found problems that he can solve for other people, uh, and, and he's doing something so that, you know, right now his problem is, how can I afford to buy a Mustang when I turn 16? <laughs> and so he's trying to solve that problem, but he's asking the right questions as he goes door to door in our neighborhood. How can I weed your lawn or your garden for you? Or can I mow your lawn? Um, he just finished building bookshelves to sell and he's he's asking the right question so he can get what he wants and and so I love that you brought that up because investigative journalism you're right it's not just for journalists it's for everyone we need to learn how to ask those kinds of questions so, and, and you just said something that triggered a nerve in me so not so much of a soapbox but I do want to say and I commend your son for what he's doing and he can teach every kid who's listening to this a very valuable lesson. You cannot, cannot wear a suit and be white collar your entire life and your entire career. If you never get your hands dirty, you are never going to actually know what the problems are. That is why that show, Undercover Boss, was so successful because not only was it great to watch, but because you could tell the CEOs of this company, once they walked a day, in their employee shoes. They understood what needed to change. And so if you're not willing to get your hands dirty, you are not going to get anywhere. That's great. And, and that's a perfect segue to what I wanted to talk about to wrap this up. So one of the things that you do is you mentor other journalists and, and other uh, reporters. And, and you do that through a ride along. And we were talking about this a little bit before, but go ahead and tell our audience kind of what you're doing now so that you can learn, but that's so you can also put out some value in your workplace. Absolutely. It's one of the greatest things I've started doing at my station because I get something out of it and so does the people I'm working with and so does our overall product as a station. It's just such a team benefit. And what we do is I'll ride along with a reporter who's only been working for a year or two, maybe it's their first job out of college, maybe it's even their second job, and they've just come out of a market like Wyoming where I was, where it's very small, and you, know, you don't have people around you that are veterans that you can learn from every day. And what I try to look at is I look at their whole day, and then at the end of the day, I focus on efficiency. I work, focus on workflow, and I say, hey, you know, you can do this a little quicker if you do that. You can do this a little better if you do that. And again, it's that thinking of, you're doing steps one, two, and three. I want you to do steps D, E, and F because it's not necessarily that my way is better. It's that this way is more efficient, that you're costing yourself time. And one of the best things we can do, no matter what profession you have, is buy yourself time. Time is something you can never purchase with money and it floats away. So the more you can purchase of your own time by just doing things more efficiently, the more time you have to focus on other things and that's a benefit to you. And when you fix those workflow things, something that you notice is that if you used to spend 20 minutes doing something, so think of any task that takes you 20 minutes. And now all of a sudden you can do it in 15 minutes just by changing your workflow. Most people aren't going to sit around for those extra five minutes. Now you have those five minutes and most people are going to use those to sand down the edges and to polish out this thing they just spent 15 minutes on. So you spend the same 20 minutes on the task, but you get five extra minutes of quality. You, your efficiency is 125% of what it was and your quality is 125% of what it was. And so examining workflow and finding ways that we can do things more efficiently 
ultimately leads to us finding ways that we can do things where our product has a better quality. And those two things go hand in hand. They are a marriage together. And so that's why right now what I do is once a week, I ride along with one of our younger reporters and I specifically look at workflow and how they can be more efficient. And then when they ask me questions of how do I do this better, it's easier because they're not struggling to meet a deadline. They've got those extra five minutes. Right. Well, and the cool thing about that is if you flip the, the script and you look at that young reporter, maybe they're not seeking you out, maybe they are, but this is something that all students can do is you can find someone who knows how to do something you want to learn how to do, ask if you can hang out with them for a while. You know, even again, talking about my 14 year old son, he wants to learn how to restore cars because he wants to get this fancy Mustang. Bad I hate enough. cars. I'm not a car guy. And so I referred him to one of my friends who is a car guy. He asked if he could work for him for free to learn how to do cars. So he started going over once a week, working on cars. And it's almost like a Miyagi situation where, <laughs> you know, he's going, he's learning these skills. And in the end, he's going to get a car, you know, he's yeah. saving up for it. But he also now has someone who has a vested interest in him learning these skills. And so I, it works both ways. You know, you can learn from someone while adding value to them. And at the same time, they're learning how to be more efficient. So it's a really kind of a smart thing to do. Absolutely. And I believe this wholeheartedly. There is nothing more valuable on this earth than the mentor-mentee relationship because you are always going to need to bounce something off of someone. And if they have that knowledge of you and they know your work ethic and they've taught you some things along the way, they are going to respect that you're coming to them for advice. And one day, even your mentors are going to come to you for advice. So it is, it's such an invaluable relationship. And you're right. People can do that today. Kids that are 10 years old could go ask 100 different people that do the job they want to do today. Can you teach me something? And, you know, maybe it just starts with sweeping up the floor or putting the tools away. But like I said, if you're not going to get your hands dirty, you're never going to really learn. And so there's so much value in that bottom level job, not even entry level, that bottom level job that eventually gets you in the door so that you can see how things work and you can really learn some stuff. Yeah. Such an awesome message. Well, Jeff, we really appreciate having you come on to the show today to talk about some of these experiences and, and what you've done in your own career. Um, if, if kids want to follow you or see what you're up to, are, is there a social platform you're on or a place where they can find you? Absolutely. Uh, if you're on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash Jeff Platt TV. If you're on Twitter, it's Jeff Platt KBAK. If you're on Instagram, it's Jeff Platt News. And if you're on TikTok, you're not going to find me because there's no <laughs> way I'm doing that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much time for your, so much. I said that wrong. Thank you so much for your time today, Jeff. Thank you, Tyler. This was fantastic. Can't wait to see it.